open up with our call to worship, and it's going to come from John, the first chapter. We get it at the first verse, amen? And it reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, amen? He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was light, and the life was the light of me. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. Amen. I've read to you John 1, the first chapter. The first verse through the sixth. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and most of all, the doing of his holy word. Let's go to God. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Father, first, we just thank you, Father, because it was your grace and your mercy, Father, that brought us thus far. And Father, we thank you for that. And Father, what we ask this morning is that your Holy Spirit will just indwell within us, Father, that we may praise and worship your name. Father, we ask your traveling grace on those that are yet here but are on their way. Father, keep them safe. Guide their path, Father, that they may come to the sanctuary to praise your name. Father, we ask your blessings on your soldier, Father, that's going to bring your word today. Father, fill him with the Holy Spirit. Father, that your truth might go forward. Because we know that your word says that as it goes out, it does not come back void, Father. So we thank you. Father, we just ask that you just have your way today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church say it. Amen. You're now in the hands of the music man. I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you cared for me in such a special way, and yes, I'll praise you, I'll lift you up, and I'll magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you can for me in such a special way and yes I'll praise you I'll lift you up and I'll magnify your name that's why my heart is filled with praise my heart my mind, my soul belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. And yes, I'll praise you. I'll lift you up and I'll magnify your name.
Amen. How many of you love the Lord on this morning? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't we serve an awesome God on this morning? Hallelujah. He is so awesome. Amen. I will ask that you stand to your feet as we do our responsive reading. Amen. We'll start out with our purpose statement, our vision statement, and our motto. Amen. Let's wake up this morning. Amen. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a little better. Amen. We'll start with our purpose, purpose statement, and it reads, God's exciting to the world by preaching, teaching, baptizing, discipling, and cultivating people in the word of God. And our vision statement reads, we envision God using us as a cultivator of his harvest in the DeSoto area and throughout the world. Furthermore, we envision cultivating the harvest through our ministry, such as preaching, child care, adult daycare, apartment Bible study, children and youth field day, and quarterly evangelism outreach. Amen. And our mighty motto. It reads, Our responsive reading will come from Proverbs, the first chapter, verses 2 through 7. I'll read the minister, you'll read the people, and we'll come together at the end. Amen. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Discretion. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. All together, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Amen. Let us heed to that word. We are now back in the hands of our music ministry.
if you know he's good today. Come on, come on, put those hands together if he's a good God. How many know that the Bible says, just taste him and see? Amen, he is good. We come to the point in our service where we welcome our visitors. If you're a member of God's exciting cathedral of praise, please stand up. To love. But not only to love, but God to forgive and to understand and to walk in the newness that you've given us. For well, you've told us that your mercies are new every morning. So God help us to realize that today, is a new day, a new opportunity to praise you like we've never praised you before. Another chance to get it right, Lord, how we love you, how we praise you. But God, we don't want to be selfish. We want to stand as an intercessor for those who can't stand God, for those who don't know you in the pardon of their sin, for those who don't know that you are a savior. You are a person that can turn midnight into day. And you can do that in the middle of a midnight. God, I pray right now, God. I pray, God, for the one that's going to come and proclaim your word. God, that you will speak to him and speak through him. But God, not that just a good word will be delivered. But God, would you fix our minds and our hearts that once it's delivered, it can be received. God, let your word search us, search us in those things that we are not worthy or not right in, God. Would your word straighten us out, God? Would your word lift us up, Lord? And as the old folks say, if there are some areas that we are too high in, Lord, let the light from the lighthouse shine on our house and bring us down where we may be too proudful. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we'll forever give you the praise. God, the names that are not uttered this morning, but are on our minds and on our hearts, God, you know what they stand in need of. God, we come this morning thanking you for the residue of the revival. God, we know that if it's going to be a revival, then we got to go and tell the story of how you brought us out, how you brought us in, how you saved us, how you reached down where we were. But then, God, not only did you do it, but we got to run and tell the story like the woman did at the well. Come see a man that satisfied all our needs. But not only must we tell the story, we must tell them that we are heavenly chosen, that you chose us before the foundation of the earth to be a worshiper, to be a praiser, to be a servant of you. Now, Lord, somebody around this altar may be in a life crisis. Help us to tell the story that we got a Christ for any crisis. His name is Jesus. He's a savior. He's a healer. He's a doctor. He's a lawyer. But most of all, he's a bedlack in the time of storm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In your son Jesus' name. Let's go back to our seat. Well, I got a feeling everything is gonna be all right. I've got a feeling everything's gonna be all right. I've got a feeling everything's gonna be all right. Be all right. Somebody ought to help me sing. I've got a feeling everything's gonna. Anybody 
else feel that way? Everything's gonna. I said I got a feeling. Everything's gonna be alright. Be alright. Be alright. Be alright. Can I tell you why I got that feeling? Well, the word of God keeps telling me everything's gonna be alright. The word of God keeps telling me every time I read it, I say the word of God keeps telling me everything's gonna be alright, be alright, be alright, be alright. Well, Jesus keeps showing me everything's gonna be alright. Jesus keeps showing me. Said that Jesus keeps showing me everything's gonna be alright, be alright, be alright, be alright. If you believe it, help me say, well, it's alright, it's alright, it's alright, Lord, it's alright, it's alright, it's alright, it's alright. It's all right. Regardless what you're going through, it's all right. Regardless what it look like, it's all right. Regardless what the devil say, it's all right. What the doctor say, it's all right. It's all right. All right. It's all right. All right. Well, I, I got that feeling. for God this morning. Amen, amen. How many of you serve a God that you know will make it all right? Amen. Pastor got our blood flowing. I appreciate him for that this morning. If you have your Bible, stand with me. No, we don't tarry long. We like to jump right in, amen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings. The third chapter, starting at the 16th verse. First Kings, third chapter, starting at the 16th verse. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. And with God's help, I hope that he will glean some things anew from the passage. Amen. When you have it signifying by saying amen. amen. First Kings chapter 3, verses 16. And it reads, and I'll be reading from the NIV. I'm usually a King James baby, but this particular passage, I like the way it reads in, in the NIV. And it says, now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One then said, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There were no one else in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she laid on him. So she got up in the middle of the night, took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman simply said, no, the living one is my son. The dead one is yours. 
But the first one insisted, no, the dead one is yours and the living one is mine. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then finally the king steps in and says, this one says my son is alive and yours is dead, while that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. The king said, you know what, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword to the king. He then gave an order to cut the living child in two. Give half of the child to one mother and half to the other one. Then the woman whose son was alive said, no, I'm filled with compassion. King, please, Lord, give her the baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither nor I shall have him or you. Go ahead and cut him in two. Then the king in his wisdom gave his ruling to the woman, said, do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel had heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. For a short while, I want to preach from the topic, what happens when selfishness meets sacrifice? What happens when selfishness meets sacrifice? Let us bow. Dear God, we love you so much for your word, dear God. I'm always in awe, dear Heavenly Father, that when I study your word, dear God, how relevant you make your word to what we're going through today, dear Heavenly Father. I ask now, dear God, that whatever it is that you want your people to hear, dear God, that I will say those things, dear God. Dear God, when they see and hear you, dear God, today, dear God, I hope that something resonates with them anew, dear God, that maybe they did not think about when they think about selfishness and sacrifice, dear Heavenly Father. Hide me behind your cross, dear Heavenly Father. Let your word fall on receptive hearts, dear Heavenly Father. Allow me to remember the things that I have studied and to preach with your power and your clarity, dear Heavenly Father. In your name we pray, amen. amen. You can let those in that are outside. What happens when selfishness meets sacrifice. God sent me on assignment this morning to remind his people that selfishness and sacrifice cannot live under the same roof. Repeat that again. God sent me on assignment this morning to remind his people, not tell his people, to remind his people that selfishness and sacrifice cannot live under the same roof. Selfishness to the body of Christ is like a cancerous cell. It seeks out everything around it that is positive to attack it and to kill it. Ultimately, to multiply itself and to make more just like it. God has designed life in such a way that we all periodically have to go through selfish checks in our lives. What are you talking about, preacher? God would uh, allow some things to happen or to threaten those things that we love or we may covet just to make sure that we remember that it's he who gave it to us and not us. Somebody said, well, preacher, you need to give us some examples, and I will. Before we get to the text, let's look at Abraham and Isaac. Isaac was a gift given to Abraham, a gift that was promised to Abraham by God. And one of the first things that God asked Abraham to do with Isaac was to sacrifice him. That was a selfish check. God was checking in with Abraham to make sure that he knew that just because I blessed you with this son, I want to make sure that you're getting that one thing that you've been praying for. It's not standing in between your obedience unto me. So the first thing that Abraham had to do was show his obedience unto God that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. It was his selfish check. Get another example. Come here, Job. Just showing you people who have gone through selfish checks. Yes, Scripture said that Job had everything that a man on earth could want. Yeah. Had a wife, had a kids, 
had cattle, had land, had more money than he could spend. But God allowed Job to go through a selfish check. Job, I want to see if I touch the finances, if I touch your family, if I touch your body, Job, will you stay connected to me? Or are you connected to the things that I've blessed you with? Give you one more example. The poor man Lazarus and the rich man. All that Lazarus was asking the rich man for was just a few crumbs from his table. But the rich man was so caught up in what he had and what he had done for himself that he didn't feel like he had the need to give unto the poor. But his life kept living and he died and found himself tormented by the flame of hell. It was the same poor man that he looked over that he wanted to just dip his finger in the water to come and cool his tongue because he was tormented in the flame. I'm just showing you selfish checks that God will give you when he has blessed you with some things. Amen? Amen. And so now when we look at the text that we have here today, we are at the beginning of King Solomon's reign. And King Solomon has asked God for supreme wisdom right before this text. And the first thing that happens with that wisdom that he asked for is we get a bird's eye view of what happens when selfishness and sacrifice are living under the same roof. <laughs> so when we look at verse 16, it says, Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. My first thing I want you to know about selfishness and sacrifice Christians is that sometimes they can look just alike. <laughs> Scripture said right here in 16th verse that two prostitutes came and stood before the king. And before he heard the story, he's just looking at two prostitutes. But one of the harlots represents selfishness and one of the harlots represents sacrifice. But if you were to look at that book from the cover, all you see is two harlots. So the first wisdom we see here is that the king had knowledge enough to know that I'm not going to judge these books by the cover. Chapter verse 16 says it plain. It says that two prostitutes stood before him. And I want you to get that in your spirit that when you're dealing with people in your personal life, sometimes selfishness and sacrifice can closely resemble one another. <laughs> so if you're dealing with people on your job, in your family, on your day-to-day -day life, be careful not to just judge the harlot by the way she looks. Because one could represent what you need and one could represent what you don't need. And you got to use godly wisdom to be able to make that decision. Amen. So it says that two prostitutes came and they stood before him. Then verse 17 says, one of them still hasn't separated them. He just says, one of them said, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. <laughs> Christians, not only can selfishness and sacrifice look just alike. Yes, I want you to know that sometimes selfishness will go through some things and endure some things with you. You didn't hear me. <laughs> While you're sacrificing, somebody is around you that is really selfish, but they're going through some things and enduring it with you. The scripture said plain as day that the first woman said, I had a baby while this woman was there. Now, I had to use my mind. I've never given birth. I don't have any child. But I know a lot goes into having a baby. <laughs> so if these two women were alone in this house, all by themselves, and they both gave birth to babies, I got sense enough to know that they was helping each other out. They was doing some things together. They was birthing the babies together. They was going through the pregnancies together. They was experiencing the pains together. Scriptures say they was in the house alone. 
So we have selfishness and sacrifice. Not only are they looking alike, but they're going through and experiencing the same thing. <laughs> so what does that say about us as Christian people? <laughs> Sometimes selfishness can look just like you. <laughs> Sometimes selfishness is coming to church just as much as you are. <laughs> Sometimes selfishness is doing the exact same services for God as you are. But it looked just alike and it's doing the same thing, preacher. But the scripture said they can't abide in the same house. But the scripture said that they both were prostitutes. Both had men coming in and out. The dough could knock and it could have been for either one of them. Now it says that they both had babies. I'm not a doctor, but it said one gave birth three days after the other. So somebody conceived around the same time. I'm just using my, 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 my physical mind. If a woman gives three days birth out to another woman, that conception took place around the same time. And so the scriptures paint a picture for us that two people can be on separate agendas, looking and doing the same thing. So one of them, my Lord, said, we had a baby together. <laughs> and it's interesting, the one that's doing all of the talking. We had a baby while she was there. Woman had a baby. We were alone. And there was no one in the house but the two of us. We get to verse 19, and she says, during the night, <laughs> her son died because she lay on him. Christians, not only can selfishness and sacrifice look alike, not only do they sometimes go and do the same things, but here's where you can begin to differentiate between the two. Selfishness has a first cousin named carelessness. <laughs> and every time selfishness shows up, carelessness seems not to be too far away. <laughs> so what I want you to do is pay attention to the people around you that are treating their blessings carelessly. Somebody is not with me. Verse 19 said, while she lay, <laughs> she overturned and slept on her baby and suffocated it. Now, I've seen a lot of mothers and a lot of children, but in my 31 years of living, I've yet to see a mother so careless with her baby that she just turned over and slept on it and suffocated it. But selfishness, I told you, and carelessness, they are first cousins. And so this is, I believe, the first inkling, even though the king didn't say much, that he had of whose child was who. But carelessness is the great indicator that selfishness is somewhere close. Then verse 20 says, so she got up in the middle of the night, took my son while I was asleep, your servant. She put him on her breast, put her dead son on my breast. Then the next morning, I got up to nurse my son. Huh. I looked at the time that the two women were moving around. Somebody was moving around in the night, and somebody was moving around in the morning time. I stop by to tell you, selfishness and darkness, it like to move around at nighttime. <laughs> See, the swapping of the dead babies, <laughs> that had to take place in the dark. Because when the light shine in the morning, I can see too much going on for you to swap your dead baby with my alive baby. What are you trying to say, preacher? The enemy goal is to swap out our dead selfishness for every living sacrifice that we have. That's why the scripture says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. Because the devil is trying to swap that out with some dead selfishness. Says, I urge you, beseech you, brethren, to present yourself a living sacrifice. God says he come that we may have life and that more abundant. The devil, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I want us to 
keep our mind on the two agendas that are being worked under the same roof. One woman's agenda, as she has already killed her blessing, huh, is to put her dead blessing off on somebody else and steal their joy. <laughs> One woman's agenda is to just take care of the blessing that God has given her. She was asleep with her baby at night. She wasn't up at 12 midnight anymore. And I began to speak to my spirit that God, maybe this harlot was trying to change her life. <laughs> maybe this prostitute was asleep because the blessing that God had given her had begun to change her desire, change her responsibility, change what she wanted to do. <laughs> but the other prostitute was still on harlot time. Because you know prostitution takes place at the night. So for whatever reason, at midnight, she was still awake. And I'm not saying that she was doing something she wasn't supposed to be. That's why she slept on her baby. I'm just looking at the times that they was moving around. People in darkness like to move at night. But early in the morning, the morning, the morning she woke up looking for her child and seeing that it had been swapped out. So what are you saying, preacher? Selfishness and sacrifice, they have two different sleeping patterns. Selfishness and sacrifice, they have two different sleeping patterns. People who are sacrificial move one way. And people who are selfish move a completely different way. I'm just trying to show you how to decipher selfishness from sacrifice because it's all under the same roof. And see, I believe that a mandate that God has given us is that in the body of Christ, we have to find a way to separate the selfish ones from the sacrificial ones <laughs> because the sacrificial ones are trying to nurture the blessing. <laughs> but the selfish ones are trying to kill the blessing. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's two different agendas under one roof. God is saying, I don't care what the outside look like. There's some different motives under one roof. So we have to figure out that selfishness, sacrifice, they can be under the same roof. They can look just alike. They can go and do about the same things. Their daily routine can look exactly the same. And the enemy goal is to swap out his dead selfishness for all of our living sacrifices. Uh, when we get to verse 21, the woman says, the next morning I got up to nurse my son. He was dead. But when I looked closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. And here come verse 22. Notice that the other woman up until this verse hasn't said a word. Huh. I stopped by to tell you that sacrifice don't have too many words. Huh. It got all action. I want to get ahead of myself. Sacrifice, when it comes to crunch time, sacrifice don't have a lot of words to say. Sacrifice just has action. <laughs> Breaking news, this has been selfishness talking for the first five or six scriptures. The king hasn't said a word. Sacrifice hasn't said a word. But somehow selfishness got all the details. They know exactly what happened, when it happened, how it happened, what time it happened. But the king and sacrifice has not said a word. But when we get to the 22nd verse, she says, no, the living one is my son, and the dead one is yours. Now the first one wants to go back and forth, because you know selfishness likes to talk. No, it's your baby that's dead, and mine that's alive. I told you the only way to determine between selfishness and sacrifice is you got to have godly wisdom. Here comes the king in verse 23, 
And I need to qualify the king's wisdom before he speaks. Solomon had just put his daddy to death and dealt with his daddy dying. He had just got all of his enemies out of the way that was trying to threaten his reign at the throne. And if you read the chapters before this, he pleased God because he said, God, all I want you to do is give me your wisdom. <laughs> I'm trying to qualify the king before he opened his mouth. God, I don't want money. I don't want women. I don't want gold. I don't want fame or fortune. God, just give me your wisdom. <laughs> and God said, I'm so pleased with what you asked me for that I'm going to give you just that. I'm going to make you more wiser than any man that will ever come or that has been. So what does the wise man do? The king said, one of you says, this is your son. And the other one says, this is your son. Here come godly wisdom. Bring me a sword. Huh. I started to be topic this message. God, please don't cut my blessing in half. But that would have been selfish because that's not what the message is about. <laughs> but he said, bring me a sword. <laughs> because you know what? We're going to get to the bottom of this real quick. <laughs> I've heard all of the, 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 the details. I've heard all of the accusations. Bring me a sword. What we're going to do is we're going to cut the blessing in half. Because me as a wise king, I, I don't have enough evidence <laughs> to make a decision. So what I'm going to do is cut the child right down the middle. One of you take the left side. One of you take the right side. And now you both got half a baby. And we can go on on about our business. <laughs> this when it got good to me. But sacrifice stepped in <laughs> and said, no, king. No, nah, king, <laughs> because I'm about sacrifice. I would rather see the blessing live with somebody else than to completely die. <laughs> I got to bring that home. It's some people at church <laughs> because they don't have the spot they want. <laughs> they would rather see the ministry die <laughs> than to live on through other people. <laughs> so, God, you know what? Cut it in half. And that's when selfishness alarmed me. Said, oh my, my, my. The other woman has already given you the whole baby. You can have it. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to see my blessing go to waste. I don't want to see what I bore for nine months die. I don't want to see what came through me dead. You can have it. I'll find a way to check on him later on. I get your address when we separate and, 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 and drive by and see how it's growing up. King just don't kill it. But I told you, selfishness is on the devil's agenda. He only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The other woman has gotten exactly what she wanted. It's in the text. But she still told the king to cut the baby in half. What does that say to me loud and clear? The woman never wanted the baby. Good God Almighty. Satan don't really want your blessing. <laughs> he got power enough to get whatever it is that you got. <laughs> he wants to steal your joy. <laughs> and y'all not listening to me. The woman didn't want the baby. <laughs> she just didn't want the other woman to have a healthy baby. And hers is dead. <laughs> the people in your life, they might not want what you got. <laughs> They just tired of seeing you smile so much. They tired of seeing how much joy you have. They tired of seeing how happy you are in your relationship, how hard you're working on your new job. Uh, they don't want what you got. They just tired of how happy you are. Talking about when selfishness and sacrifice are under the same roof. And so now the woman says, I want my baby to live. She can keep the baby, just don't kill him, king. And the king says, I'm very wise here. I've asked God for wisdom 
on a level that y'all can't even understand. Y'all thought when I asked for the sword that I was just being another bloodthirsty king. But Solomon was saying that godly wisdom says that sacrifice wants to see it live and selfishness wants to see it die. So when sacrifice steps up and says you can have the blessing, the king knew immediately that's the real mama. Because any mama that has went through labor pains, any mama that has experienced what it takes to have a child, surely is not going to sit here and watch me cut the baby in half. And so immediately the king made a decision that resonated all throughout the nation. And we have a bird's eye view of what happened when sacrifice and selfishness come together. But before I take my seat, I need you to know that this was not the first time that sacrifice and selfishness was under the same roof. <laughs> the scripture says that there was a last supper that took place. <laughs> and sacrifice and selfishness was under the same roof. <laughs> sacrifice sat at the table as he broke bread. <laughs> and he looked at selfishness and said... You are going to betray me. <laughs> Selfishness began to look around the table <laughs> to see exactly who it was that was going to betray him. <laughs> then Jesus said, you might want to go ahead and go on about your business. <laughs> Time is getting far spent, Selfishness, <laughs> and you got an appointment that you got to keep. <laughs> look at sacrifice as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> And I believe selfishness began to creep into human form just a little bit. Because God, Jesus, looked up to God and said, if it be any other way, remove this cup from me. But then sacrifice kicked back in and said, but not my will, but your will be done. So then selfishness came and arrested sacrifice. The scripture says that they took him from courtroom to courtroom. Selfishly trying to throw charges on sacrifice, spitting on sacrifice, slapping sacrifice, marking sacrifice as the king of the Jews. But we already found out earlier in the text that sacrifice don't have many words when the rubber meet the road. So the scripture said that he never said a mumbling word. All the lies being told on him, everything being done to him, sacrifice just stood tall because he knew he couldn't be selfish for me and for you. Says that they took sacrifice up to Golgotha, placed him on a hill called Calvary, and then they put sacrifice in between two selfish individuals. <laughs> Say that they raised up sacrifice in the middle of two selfish people. And I told you when sacrifice and selfishness meet, one of them got to go. So selfishness looked over at sacrifice and said, I don't want to be selfish no more. It got to be something about you because you keep on sacrificing when you don't have to. So if you would, take little old selfish me with you when you get up to glory. Said that they put a nail in sacrifice left hand. Said they put a nail in sacrifice right hand. If I'm reading it right, it said they riveted his feet. Said they punched him in the side and the sacrificial blood of the sacrificial lamb begin to roll all down our sacrifice. It says our sacrifice hung, bled, and he died. Look at the ultimate sacrifice as he gives up the ghost. And I'm so glad that the scriptures say he gave up the ghost. Nobody took it from him. He gave up the ghost. And when he gave up the ghost, he took our sacrifice down and put our sacrificial lamb in a bar or tomb. <laughs> it says that all Thursday night, <laughs> selfishness thought it won. <laughs> all Friday morning, <laughs> selfishness thought that it was over. <laughs> Friday evening and Friday night, <laughs> selfishness thought that they sacrificed <laughs> the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> all day Saturday, <laughs> sacrifice was still in the bar or tomb. <laughs> Look at the people selfishly saying, <laughs> 
He's just another man. He's just like the rest of them. He bleeds like the rest of them. He dies like the rest of them. But early Sunday morning, I'm so glad that the sacrifice rose up with all power in his hand. Power for me and for you to be able to decipher when there's selfishness around us. All I'm trying to say, people of God, is that if we're going to be sacrificial, we can't be selfish. Christians are called to be the most sacrificial people on this earth. We have to continue to let people use us, even though sometimes they abuse us. We have to keep giving a message that people keep turning a deaf ear to. We have to keep praying to the same folks that don't like us. We have to keep giving when we don't see the change in what we're giving to. Because selfishness and sacrifice, it can't bide under the same roof. And I don't want God to cut my blessing in half. I'd rather watch it grow and live on somewhere else. Come on, come on, come on. 